Alibaba, here we go, the big daddy. This is the uh, biggest uh, part of my portfolio. It's over 20%, and I just added uh, about 60% to my positions via long-dated calls yesterday, which was March 15th, and that was when the stock was trading at 75 bucks. And it's the 16th now after the close, and if you know anything about the stock market, you'll you know that the Chinese stocks went ballistic today, and Alibaba's up 37%, I think, on the day, uh, up to 105. Now, I was going to record this video a couple of days ago, but I didn't have time. Um, I'm on uh, holidays right now, and uh, as you can tell, the, the I don't have the big weird flower that my wife bought behind my head uh, today, and maybe the lighting's a bit different, but... Um, yeah, it was unfortunately I didn't get it out in time, um, or else I might look uh, I might have looked quite smart at this point. But uh, anyway, those calls are uh, I'm not saying that to be cocky. That was a total fluke, and I feel very lucky today. Um, anybody who's been in the market for any amount of time knows that picking bottoms is a uh, a bit of a fool's errand. And if you're trying to do that, it's not really going to usually work out well. Um, I, I just buy when I think, think things are crazy cheap, no-brainer cheap level, and yesterday they were at 75 bucks for Alibaba. Um, so in this video, I'm just going to talk quickly about, I'm going to talk about a couple of things um, in terms of the possible reacceleration of growth in the company, and then I'm going to do a quick valuation, um, just a, a simple one to show my uh, how I'm thinking about this. Um, there are a lot of risks with Alibaba, and a lot of people are talking about the risks involved for the last 18 months. And I'm, I'm doing a sec separate video on that well, where I'll talk about each one of them with, you know, uh, tech crackdown, delisting, um, and what are the other ones? Uh, slowing growth, which we'll talk about in this video. Uh, Taiwan, possible recession in China. So if you're interested in that stuff, check the other video out after this one. Um, but, you know, I was thinking... In terms of this video, I was thinking a bit about uh, one of Buffett's lines, and he talks about saying, he says, I'd rather have a great business at a fair price than a fair business at a great price. And we, we all know that, we all know that line, everybody's heard it. Um, but what about if you can get a situation where you can get a great business at a great price? Now, that doesn't happen very often. I've been in the market a while, and uh, even in hindsight, it's really hard to see these situations. Um, maybe you can buy them, you know, at early stage, but um, I'm thinking more uh, developed companies. Um, and I was looking back and I, I remember a situation in 2013 where Apple was trading at below nine times earnings. And I'll put the, uh, the chart up here. And Apple had a lot of problems back then. And there was a lot of fear around the stock. Uh, they had they had major major fears around uh, their margins were actually uh, contracting they were um, they were declining uh, the growth rate was slowing down and Android was starting to eat some of their lunch or more of their lunch I guess and taking market share from them and so there was a lot of fear around Apple like oh the party's over the growth you know, they're no long, longer a growth company they're um, you know a more mature stalwart kind of company and it got repriced quite a bit down and people really didn't believe that Apple was going to um, continue to be a great company. Uh, in hindsight, if you bought that the stock back in 2013, you would be up tenfold at this point because they figured out how to reaccelerate growth. Um, they took advantage of their massive ecosystem where people are essentially locked. If you buy an iPhone, you're locked in. Um, it's, it's quite a pain to try and change uh, away from an iPhone. Um, to an Android uh, for various reasons, but um, and and the whole Apple ecosystem. So people weren't valuing that and thinking that Apple could um, re reaccelerate their situation. Now going now talking about now, I look at Alibaba and I think it's possible that we're in a situation like that. If you talk to anybody about Alibaba, it's all fear. It's all fear about the Chinese government. What if they invade Taiwan? What if they get delisted? Blah blah blah. All this stuff and. As I'm, I'm going to show later, the, the price earnings ratio on this company is extremely low, and that's even after the 37% run up today. Um, so it's, 
you know, I'm looking at the situation as this is a possible deal of a lifetime situation. And that's why I essentially backed up the truck yesterday and said, I'm, I'm it's $75 and I'm, I'm going for it. Um, but in terms of one of the, uh, one of the concerns that the market has right now is that the growth rate has slowed down and there's a fear that it's, it's really, um, ground to a halt. Now I'm going to, I, I think that it's possible that in quarter four, 2022, which is the, the March ending quarter, um, that we might see an actual in, acceleration in, in, in growth rate, uh, and I'll explain why. So at the end of the second quarter, they came out with their guides for the year, which is 20 to 23% revenue growth for the year. Um, and if we, ex and now we're all the way through quarter three, which quarter three posted a 10% growth rate. So there's a lot of fear around that. And I think that's driving a lot of the uh, downward pressure on the price. Um, because 10% is ex extremely low uh, for, from Alibaba's perspective. And their, and their China commerce arm was actually negative 1%, which, which was a, a big chunk of that fear. Um, but I believe if we just use their, uh, very simplistically, if we, if we use their guidance, uh, which they put out after quarter two, which they didn't, they didn't pull after quarter three, so which makes me think that they're still committed to it. They still think it's a realistic target. If we used that 20 to 23% full year growth rate, then that would indicate that quarter four should come in between 13 and 24%. Now, if it is anywhere in that range, that looks like an acceleration from quarter three, which I think could alleviate a lot of the fears uh, behind the growth rate. Um, so that's, that's something to look for in the quarter three, quarter four earnings. Um, one of the, th one of the thought that I've had around the, uh, earnings and the growth rate is that not the earnings, the growth rate on the revenue is that if they, um, they've had some quite difficult, uh, comp comps in 2020 throughout, uh, f the calendar year, 2021, um, in that they had their, essentially they had their monopoly pulled from them uh, on the China commerce thing where they, they had that whole system where you could, if you listed on your, your products on Alibaba, you couldn't list it on any other site. And the CCP took that away from them and fined them for it, which I think is totally legitimate. I mean, you couldn't get away with that in, in the U S or in Europe or in Canada or Australia or anything. You, you couldn't get away with that stuff. Um, so I think that was a legitimate fine. It was a legitimate crackdown by the government and because of that change, they've had some, they'd had a difficult time growing in China because they're essentially comparing monopoly last year to a non-monopoly this year. However, in, in next, the next 12 months, they're going to be comparing their non-monopoly to a, to the non-monopoly. So it's actually uh, a more fair comparison. And I think that's going, that's possibly going to drive the growth rate up beyond negative 1%, like we saw in the last quarter. Um, and that's because Alibaba has been investing heavily in their, in their China growth. And that's w why some of the uh, free cash flow numbers have come down this year is because they're, they're reinvesting in the China, China con commerce arm, which is good. I think that's what they should be doing. Um, so they had a difficult time with comps on that front. And they also had a difficult time in comps, I believe, because of the COVID situation. Now the, through, as we know, through 2020, early 2021, there was the, the stay at home companies did really well, uh, that Alibaba was one of them. They did really well because people were ordering more, um, than they ever have. And I believe this is the COVID hangover year, um, for these kind of companies. So I think that's also pu uh, putting pressure on their, um, on their, uh, growth rates as well. And so in the next 12 months, Again, that's going to normalize and the comps will get easier. So I really believe that in the next 12 months, they have a good chance of alleviating a lot of those growth fears uh, based on those two reasons. Um, in terms of the valuation, now I don't, I don't always do, I don't usually do a discounted cash flow models because I've, I buy things so cheap that when I run them through the discounted cash flow, it always looks good. Um, I don't want an investment where I, where I have to kind of, where it's like, 
you know, the, discount, the DCF looks kind of close, like, oh, it might be 12% undervalued if this happens, if this happens. And it reminds me of another, uh, another uh, Buffett situation where I saw him and Munger talking at one of the, uh, their conferences and somebody was asking them about uh, the, you know, discounted cash flow model and, you know, how do they do it and why do they do that? And, and Warren explained, you know, it's the, he explained the way he always does, you know, it's the discounted cash flow of the business over the life of the life of the business. And Munger pipes up and he says, yeah, but I don't think I've ever seen Warren do one of these. And Warren Buffett goes, yeah, it has to be pretty obvious. So I kind of take that view. Like I, I know if I get a, a, a high growth rate at a very low price multiple, I know the discounted cash flow is going to look good. So I don't really worry about it that much. So I'm more looking at the sort of peg ratio, which is growth versus, versus the price that I'm paying, um, the price earnings that I'm paying. Um, so if we, with that in mind, let's look at the, um, the valuation stats here. Now I did two, two examples here. One was from a few days ago at 75 bucks. So you'll see that it looks like it looks extremely cheap at that level. And the one at 105 is the current level that we can look at. Um, but what I'm doing here is I'm saying at $105 uh, per share, the market cap's roughly two, 285 billion. They have 59 billion in net cash. And I've used a few um, projections for cash flow that, you can, that we can use to estimate the price to, to cash flow. So after quarter three, after the first three quarters this year, They've had eight, eight, about 18 billion in US dollar cash flow. So if they actually got zero, uh, zero free cash flow in quarter four, then that would put the trailing price to free cash flow at 12.5. Very cheap. And that's assuming, again, zero in quarter four. Now, and the, uh, the other side, if we use the 2020 free cash flow figure, which is actually it's down now. But if you said, okay, well, 2020 is a more reasonable year after they finish the big investment in 2021, they'll go back uh, definitely towards this number, if not higher. And that number is 26.5 billion. The price to free cash flow is about 8.5. And then uh, based on my estimates for quarter four, I think that the free cash flow might land uh, around 22 billion. That's just a, that's just a ballpark guess. But if it lands there and they get four billion in the in the last quarter, then the multiple is at 10.25. Uh, a high end estimate for quarter four might be uh, two and a half billion higher, so that would put it at a 9.2. But any of these numbers, if you say this company is growing at 20 percent per year, 20 to 23 percent per year, and you're getting a price uh, price earnings price price to free, free cash flow of 10 you're getting a peg ratio of 0 0.5 or lower, which is ridiculous. Um, and that's at 105. And this is, you know, I'm sorry I didn't get this out earlier, but on the price yesterday was even lower. Like if we look here, it's more about, it's more like it's about 6.5 at $75. So if the price gets back to 75, if I've got cash lying around, I'll buy more um, because that's insane. That's a, you're getting a, again, 20% growth rate for a 6.5 multiple, which is totally nuts. Um, there, there's so much good stuff about this, this company. If you ignore the, uh, the constant negative noise around the media, the tailwinds are massive. The, the Chinese middle class is growing. Their, their purchasing power is growing super fast within the middle class. Uh, the, China has the Belt and Road Initiative, which means trade between um, Asian countries. And I, I believe it goes all the way to um, Eastern Europe. Uh, that, you know, that, that increases their, their opportunities there. There's, there. As we know, there's lots of people in Asia. So the long-term tailwinds are massively, are massive there. And not to mention that, again, my, my main thesis here with Alibaba is that they have seven arms to the business and only one of them is profitable and the other six are in investment stages. They're building their ecosystems, they're building their footprints, they're investing in growth, they're investing in the customer, they're doing, they're, and they're just pushing all their money back in into building those, those big, big 
and um, as strong as they can get before they even try to monetize them. So you have all these, including cloud, which is the probably the biggest uh, possible, the biggest opportunity they have, which is not hasn't even hit the ground running yet. Um, so so you you're basically paying for China commerce, and you're getting all these other six um, six businesses for free that are in the investment stages. Um, so I would say this is a, a company that has a huge runway ahead of it. Um, it, it. It's quite big already, so it makes growth more difficult. But um, I think that given their goal of 2 billion uh, customers, uh, they definitely have the ability to grow to an enormous size. Okay, and then just uh, quickly on the summary of my uh, what I'm what I'm doing here, I'm I'm definitely going to hold this for a long time. I'm not looking for a quick buck here. I'm not going to, even though my <laughs> my options doubled, I think since yesterday. I'm not going to sell them. Those are I'm actually looking at those as just as shares. Um, I and and I think that this is probably a situation where you can get a four to five times your money in five years. And just quickly on that idea here. Um, the if we have a uh, price to free cash flow, I'll use the 10.25 and a growth rate of 15%, then uh, the free cash flow should grow to 44 billion in five years, and that would mean the market cap at a 15 PE is uh, 719, which is an upside of uh, about 150% from here, and that's a 20% growth rate uh, compounded. If on the low side, if you only got 10% growth rate and a, and a term and a multiple of uh, 10 at the end of that, then um, the upside is only about 45% from here, which is still 7.8% per year. On the upside, uh, if we had a 15% growth rate and the terminal multiple is 20, then we're looking at uh, basically a four bagger from this point. Now. And I don't really, I'm not really estimating which one of these is going to come true. Again, I don't really look at the dis discounted cash flow type of idea here, but I, I think any of these models, if I just run it through quickly, I think this thing's undervalued even a, in a bad scenario. Um, so I'm very comfortable putting my money in this company. Okay, well, if you want to talk, if you want to hear about um, some thoughts on the risks involved that everybody's talking about, that, that the CCP is alleviated some of today, which is great, actually. Um, I've done another video, and I'll post that as soon as I can. Thanks.